for joining us for today's discussion. My name is Arabella Puda Ehlers, and I'm the program manager for children, youth, and families here at the National Association of Counties Research Foundation. Um, we're very excited to be hosting another round of our virtual peer learning network series, which focuses on county level leading innovations and strategies for expanding high quality services for young children from prenatal to age three. We created these networks for counties to have a virtual interactive space to engage with peers on prenatal to three topics. Today's discussion will feature both national and county experts and explore strategies related to supporting home-based childcare providers. These prenatal to three peer learning networks are a part of our Counties for Kids initiative. Counties for Kids is a public awareness campaign um, for county leaders who are committed to making investments in young children from prenatal to age three. Through Counties for Kids, we have free online tools and resources available for all counties, no matter where you are in your early childhood journey. You can find these resources and more at countiesforkids.org. I also wanted to take a few minutes at the start of our session today to share a new resource that we're just starting to push out um, called the Counties for Kids Neighborhood. The neighborhood allows county leaders to ask questions, share best practices, and virtually learn from experts and each other. Um, it's a virtual platform um, similar to like a discussion forum. Um, and the goal is really to create a space for you to continue to have the kind of conversations that we have in these peer learning network convenings. The neighborhood will be exclusively focused on county's needs, challenges, and opportunities, and provide a safe space for questions and peer learnings. It's being hosted on the National Collaborative for Infants and Toddlers Exchange platform. Um, and we'll share a little bit, I'll share a resource after this um, session in the follow-up email to kind of help give you a, a how-to for the neighborhood, um, but just a basic overview. To join it, you'll need to create an account on the exchange if you don't already have one. So you can visit the link that's on the slide here. Um, it'll be in the chat as well um, and in my follow-up email, but it'll prompt you to create a username and password um, and then ask you, you can request to join the Counties for Kids neighborhood. Um, from there, you can start a discussion, reply to other people's posts, share resources, ask questions. Um, and to help get us started, I've created a discussion thread about home-based childcare and this week's peer learning networks. Um, so after today's session, I'd encourage you to check it out, um, share your thoughts, your takeaways, any questions you still have, and just keep this conversation going, connect with the counties who joined the other networks, um, just create a space where we can all kind of share our, our thoughts and takeaways. Um, and like I said, I'll share the more comprehensive how-to guide in my follow-up email. Um, so just quickly before I hand it over to our speakers today, um, some housekeeping reminders. Please note that today's meeting is being recorded. Um, I know we're all very familiar with Zoom at this point, but there's some visual guidance on the screen for muting and unmuting, starting and stopping your video, accessing the chat box and raising your hand. Um, and we'll go ahead and test out the chat now. Um, so if you wanna just take a minute to share your name and your county so we know who's in the virtual room with us. Um, and during the first half of our session today, you'll be hearing from our speakers and we do ask that you remain muted during the speaker presentations, um, but encourage you to continue to use the chat to engage with the presenters and with each other, um, asking questions, reacting or sharing your experiences. And then for the second half of our convening, we'll open it up for an engaging and interactive discussion with everyone in the room. Um, this is really a time to learn from each other and share best practices within your county. So we encourage you to engage with the speaker and with each other um, and keep your video on if you're comfortable and able, uh, particularly when you're sharing your question or speaking otherwise. Um, throughout the discussion, you can use the raise hand function to indicate you'd like to share or since we have a pretty small group, you can just unmute and begin speaking. Uh, and if you face any technical difficulties at any time, you can send a message to me directly in the chat or to my colleague, Alana Hurley. And thank you to those of you introducing yourself in the chat. I'm glad to have you all here today. Um, so I'm gonna just to kind of set a baseline. I'm gonna share a poll that asks a little bit about where your county or organization stands right now with um, local home-based childcare providers. So you'll see a few options, um, you know, very strong, connecting regularly, have that culture of trust, improving, starting to be able to identify where home-based childcare is and connect them to resources um, or developing, really trying to learn more about how to make these connections. 
Um, or if none of these fit, you can choose other and share more details in the chat. Um, so I'll just leave this up for a minute while I talk about what we're going to do today. Um, so we'll be focusing on how county leaders can support home-based child care providers, including family child care homes and more informal family friend and neighbor care. Our speakers will be sharing strategies to improve the quality of home-based child care, increase access, and better support these providers and their unique needs. I'm going to share the results from the poll. It looks like we have most people kind of in the middle ground. Um, but a range of folks, a range of results. So we can come back to this in our discussion later. I'd love to hear more about kind of where you all are and what your challenges and strengths have been so far. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over now to Natalie, who will be opening it up for us. Uh, Natalie is the Executive Director of Homegrown, a national collaborative of funders committed to improving the quality of and access to home-based childcare. Homegrown is working to remove policy barriers, strengthen home-based childcare practices and business models, and support the growth and recognition of the sector so that all providers offer quality care and parents choose quality care. Prior to joining Homegrown, Natalie led the expansion of the Early Childhood Education Group at Public Health Management Corporation in Philadelphia. Natalie has also overseen the development of large programs, secured funding for major initiatives, and supported local systems change in the early learning sector. Natalie, thank you so much for being with us today, and I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Arabella and Rashida, for including me in these conversations. It's really lovely to be here with all of you today. Um, we can get started uh, with our slides. The way I've designed these slides is that they have a ton of information on them and lots of links, um, so there are leaves behind for you if you want to dig back into them and um, pursue some of these links, but I'm going to try to cover them um, uh, quickly and efficiently so that I can turn it over to my friends in King County so that they can share their amazing work. Um, so, you know, why are we here? Why are we talking about home-based child care? Why is homegrown um, committed to this issue? Because that's where lots and lots of children who we care deeply about are having their early childhood experiences. Um, home-based care is uh, as large a share of the child care um, sector as, as uh, center-based care. And when we're talking about home-based care, we're really thinking about this broad and inclusive stance that includes licensed family child care and small businesses, license exempt kind of legally, but known, uh, you know, home-based child care from friends and neighbors, and all the other child care arrangements that families may use to meet their child care needs. And we know that this is where kids who we, we care deeply about, kids and um, babies, uh, children of color, children with special needs, ch children um, whose families work non-traditional hours are having their early childhood experiences. And we also know that home-based child care has historically been really excluded from lots of supports and is under-investigated and under-resourced as a part of our early childhood system. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, while things weren't great for the home-based child care sector prior to the pandemic and pre-pandemic, we saw a declining um, share of licensed providers. Uh, we knew that most home-based providers were living in poverty while working full-time, and many uh, struggled to gain access to basic um, services and supports, including health insurance. Things got significantly worse, um, and kind of a uh, uh, during the pandemic. And we saw that while demand for home-based care and reliance on home-based care increased, the sector really faced a number of hardships from health you know, concerns, um, not just for themselves, for their families, but also for the children and families that they serve, many financial and fiscal concerns. Um, and we also saw among home-based providers, you know, challenges with accessing some of the relief uh, opportunities that were made available, like the PPP and state uh, relief funds. And that those challenges were particularly um, severe for family, friend, and neighbor providers who are excluded from many um, early childhood systems. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, while I think this has been true for some time, we really are at this incredible moment to think about investing and reforming in the home-based childcare sector. Um, and for us, we're really focused on the opportunity to really focus on equity, recognizing that um, providers, families, and children that are served in this setting, um, you know, are often marginalized from resources and supports 
and that this is an opportunity to really um, uh, ensure that they can fully participate in robust early childhood systems. We know that there is this shifting demand and preference that we think will continue to, um, you know, be a part of our childhood, early childhood system, and that that's really compounded by the fact that uh, there are changing uh, employment dynamics with, addition, you know, non-traditional care, unpredictable care, you know, shifting care from hybrid and home. And then that there's incredible opportunity to make these investments right now, both through the previous COVID relief, but um, with the potential for additional federal action that could bring additional resources into home-based care. So with that in mind, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the strategies that we're really excited about and think there are opportunities to deepen as we support the uh, home-based childcare sector. So one of the key issues that we're focused on is really thinking about how government and public sources can invest in infrastructure that ensures that timely information, resources, and financing can get to providers in good times and in bad times. We think about this infrastructure um, as networks um, and see effective networks as an opportunity to, uh, for, to support providers in offering high quality child development services to be financially sustainable um, and to also be sort of that connective tissue that ensures that providers can get health, mental health, and disability support. And we're definitely going to deepen our conversation around comprehensive services in the um, discussion with our colleagues in King County. Next slide, please. Um, this is just kind of an infographic that shows what a network might look like with this blue box being those public um, policy and financing resources, this orange circle being the hub of that network that's getting support to home-based providers and families. And then these really important green arrows um, demonstrating the role that providers and families have in informing system governance and um, policy and decision-making. Thinking about networks as that kind of connective tissue um, that can really help deploy critical services and supports, we're sort of tracking a few different opportunities to support um, uh, to support home-based providers. You can go to the next slide. Um, I think lots of communities are really interested in thinking about how to build supply uh, given both that we had an adequate supplier prior to the pandemic, um, and we know that that continues to be the case. So thinking about multiple kind of strategies to both identify and support unlisted, unpaid home-based providers as a part of a supply system to support legally exempt providers and gaining access to public supports and subsidies and then to support providers who are interested in becoming licensed or in increasing their, the size of their license program by adding uh, staff and additional support. Next slide, please. Um, we think there are lots of opportunities to really um, improve, to, to support quality building um, based on the assets that are already present in home-based childcare. So thinking a lot about kind of the how, the modalities that we might use to, to reach and connect with home-based providers, and the what, the curriculum and supports that they may need. Um, for us, we've really recognized that uh, uh, working with community-based organizations that already have trust and that share cultural and linguistic characteristics of this provider community is really critical, um, but are really excited to see, you know, emerging models around adapting home visiting, play and learn groups, emotional support groups, and comprehensive services supports for uh, family, friends, and neighbor providers and other home-based providers as some promising strategies. And then um, we can go to the next slide, please, Arabella. Um, I think really underpinning all of this is a recognition that uh, for us to have a thriving childcare sector, we need providers themselves to be economically stable and to thrive. Um, and so really thinking about ways to expand access to um, childcare subsidies and public financing to support benefits counseling and meet basic needs um, and really see that network as a potential solution to get those types of supports and to help providers, you know, uh, come into these systems, um, you know, and, and um, get connected to resources. So I am going to uh, leave it there. This um, presentation has lots and lots of links and resources. I'm also going to drop a couple of links in the chat 
um, including a little flyer for an initiative for a, a technical assistance initiative at Homegrown focused on building and sustaining uh, comprehensive networks. And I am going to turn it over to my colleagues in King County who are doing some incredibly exciting work. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce Jessica Tolinar Cafferty. Um, she is the child care policy lead for King County Best Starts for Kids. Her background includes work in the child care health consultation and early learning and in the inclusion of child care settings. She brings a deep commitment to equity and social justice. Jessica is a mama to Varden and Luther and in her free time enjoys gardening, eating great food and adventuring with her family. Um, so uh, pleased to, to, to know Jessica and her exciting work and to turn it over to her now. Thanks, Natalie. It's such a pleasure to be here today um, and it's been really wonderful to learn from uh, many of, I think, you who are um, with us today through some of the work that Homegrown and NACO um, are doing. So I am really excited to be able to share a little bit of the work that we're doing at King County. Um, in the past six years through uh, our Best Starts for Kids initiative, we have really begun to deepen our investments um, and our relationships with child care providers and caregivers. Um, really thinking that of that as the full spectrum of options where um, kids and families um, are in care. I do want to say really quickly, I am joined by my colleague today, Lucy Dong, who manages our child care health consultation program through Best Starts for Kids. Um, I'm going to be sharing a little bit about Lucy's work, but she is here for Q&A because she is really going to be the expert on all of that work. Lucy, I don't know if you want to say hello real quick. Hi everyone. Uh, I don't really have a nice intro prepared like you all do, but um, yeah, I'm here for the Q&A part and thank you, Jessica, for presenting on behalf of both of us. Yeah, absolutely. Arabelle, you can go to the next slide. So I'm going to ground us today in our commitment at Best Starts for Kids. Um, the work I'm, that we're going to present on today is not limited just to our work through the Best Starts initiative, um, but I think this is a helpful place to kind of understand our philosophy and what really guides all of the work we're doing in partnership with um, child care providers and caregivers. And that's this idea of happy, healthy, safe, and thriving that we believe all kids, families, um, child care providers, caregivers, and communities deserve to be happy, healthy, safe, and thriving. Next slide, please. And so um, over the past few years, the county has really grown, I, I would say exponentially, our investments in childcare. Um, and that's been driven primarily by a lot of engagement with our community and an understanding of the field um, in our region. Um, so we had known that sort of nationally, this was a really important issue. When we launched our first Best Starts for Kids levy six years ago, um, we heard loud and clear that childcare was a significant need for families in our region. Um, and at that time, we didn't have the resources available to really deeply invest in childcare at a large scale, but we did have some initial investments. Um, since then, we've convened a group of stakeholders that include families, childcare providers, systems folks, former electeds, um, home visitors, all kinds of folks who are somehow connected to the world of childcare. Um, and in 2020, they released a report of 20 recommendations for the county to consider um, really around not just access and affordability, but building a thriving ecosystem of care for kids and families um, and the people who offer that care. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I wanted to share a little bit about what came out of that report because it guides us in everything that we're investing in now. Um, and some of the key things were really uh, a sort of a, a, a persistent commitment to equity and in particular racial equity. Um, a recognition that that's not just sort of a program investment that the county can make, but something that should be continually integrated into everything we do, the conversations we have, the investments we make, how we do evaluation, all of these things. Um, and understanding that that is connected to how we use county revenue and how we think about how we raise funds and how we use funds. They also made some really tangible programmatic recommendations that included things like um, equitable wages, thriving wages for child care providers and caregivers, um, financial supports for families. Uh, in King County, it costs more to send your kiddo to licensed child care than it does to send them to public universities. So it's very, very expensive. Um, they also thought about child care as a full spectrum and thinking about um, families having access to the care that best meets their needs, whether that is a large center, a smaller family child care site, 
or an informal caregiver or FFN caregiver um, that the family knows and trusts um, and that meets their needs as a family. And so thinking about not creating sort of silos of this work, but really saying, how do we strengthen the field as a whole so that these caregivers are valued and supported and families have these options? Um, and to them, that meant tailored supports also for FFN caregivers. And then the last thing I would just highlight is an idea of comprehensive supports for black and brown providers um, and for men in the early learning field. So in King County, our childcare workforce, especially when you include home-based care is more diverse than our general population. Um, and a recognition that uh, many of these providers are, are not paid or underpaid um, and are undervalued and under supported. And so a, a real commitment to sort of uplifting and supporting um, the incredible skill and talent and labor that exists there. Next slide, please. So there's a few investments that are currently happening at King County that I just want to highlight before we move into Best Starts investments. Um, these three uh, investments all pertain to home-based care in one way or another. Um, the first is that we have through our vets and human services levy um, a pilot around serving uh, student veterans who need access to childcare while they go to school. Um, one of the things that's really exciting about that pilot is that we had um, pretty unrestricted funding. And so we've been able to take some uh, more creative approaches. Um, a big part of that was serving families who needed FFN care and reimbursing those caregivers um, at a very high rate, much higher than what you typically see at um, county level government. And so um, that program is still relatively new. It's wrapping up its first year. Um, but we're really interested in learning more about how we effectively serve the full range of caregivers and child care providers. Um, and the families who are accessing that care through that project. The second one is our, oh, sorry, we go back one. The uh, PASTA Early Learning Facilities, this is um, an investment in actual facilities to really expand care. Um, at this time, this is not funding FFN care, but we are, uh, we do have a specific fund for family child care providers. So really meeting the needs of family child care providers to um, improve their space, expand their space, do what they need to have a space that is really high quality, safe, and nurturing for kiddos. And then the last thing I'll highlight is just some emergency care that, uh, programs that we've done. We've run three rounds of emergency care um, funding through the pandemic. One was a reallocation of local funds, and two were through federal um, COVID response funds, ARPA and the CARES Act. Um, and one of the things that's been exciting about emergency care is similarly, it's given us the opportunity for these sort of short-term projects to pilot some um, approaches to serving FFN caregivers, to serving family-based, uh, family child cares. Um, and we've done that through a number of different mechanisms, but primarily through uh, either subsidies that were sort of enhanced so that providers got more than the cost of care um, or direct grants. So we've made a couple rounds of direct grants that were um, pretty low barrier, both to family child care providers and to informal and FFN caregivers. So lots of learning happening there. And now I will move into um, best starts as we begin our second round um, of the uh, levy. So we just got renewed by voters last year and we'll have another six years. Um, and we are moving into some really deep investments here. So I will share a little bit about those. Next slide, please. So the first one I wanna share um, about is childcare health consultation. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with childcare health consultation, it is uh, typically a multidisciplinary support system for licensed childcare. Um, there has been some history of certain informal caregivers through childcare health consultation, but really limited. Um, typically, it's provided by a nurse, uh, mental health consultant, nutritionist, and maybe some community health workers. Um, when we were able to pass the first round of Best Starts for Kids, it was really clear from community feedback that that missed a large portion of care where kids are, including FFN caregivers um, and including sort of the need for some specific tailored supports. And so over the past few years, we have partnered with community-based organizations to offer both sort of these more traditional models of health consultation, um, as well as some community-based pilots that really serve specific communities. Um, and many of these are delivered by community health workers who are of and from community and have deep relationships there. And so through this, we've been able to support a number of health consultation programs that work directly with FFM caregivers um, and learn a lot about what is and is not effective there. Next slide, please. 
Uh, in particular, I want to share a little bit about how this program has sort of flexed and pivoted during the pandemic when we have seen huge changes um, for child care providers and caregivers. Um, one of the things that's really exciting is that this program in particular has been able to sort of pause and adapt um, as it identified emerging needs. And so I want to talk a little bit about how those needs have been identified um, over the past two years, and then how we've partnered um, with others to sort of deploy <clears throat> the needed resources. Um, the main way that these needs have really been identified is in partnership directly uh, with the community-based organizations who are delivering uh, child care health consultation services. So through um, both regular calls, where we sort of uh, have the opportunity to get feedback and hear about emerging needs in community, as well as through opportunities for peer support. So um, child care health consultation providers coming together and sharing how they're supporting families, how they're supporting caregivers, um, and sort of working together to develop those strategies. The other thing we've been able to do is reallocate levy uh, underspend um, to sort of meet needs that we didn't anticipate. So for example, PPE was a really big need during the pandemic in particular at the beginning. And so the ability to sort of reallocate some of those levy funds and understand that they were still meeting the intent of healthy, safe environments for kids and families um, allowed the CCHC program to launch a PPE distribution program. All of this work couldn't have happened without deep partnerships. Um, I think at the core are partnerships with community-based organizations um, two in particular that serve uh, FFN caregivers are Chinese Information Service Center and Sisters in Common. Um, they have deep relationships in community and work directly um, with the caregivers around them um, to sort of meet their needs and help them meet the needs of the families and kids that they're serving. And again, that flexibility to sort of pause and adjust service models was really critical um, to continue to be a supportive environment during the pandemic. We also partnered really closely with Child Care Resources, um, which is our uh, regional uh, resource and referral agency to distribute and procure those um, COVID supplies, both to licensed care, but also to FFM caregivers. Um, sort of a less expected one, T-Mobile, we partnered with to do uh, bulk, bulk purchases of tablets for family child care sites. And then um, we partner with our environmental health agency at the county to distribute toxic free nap mats and HEPA units, um, and with a real focus on both family child care sites and FFN caregivers. Next slide, please. There are also two other big investments that are starting this year uh, in child care through Best Starts for Kids. The first is a child care subsidy program. Um, this is a program that we are hoping will serve about 3,000 kids and their families um, that really is intended to build upon existing subsidy program in our state. Um, we're removing things like work requirements so that we can really fully meet needs of families who are not well served by existing systems. And I think one of the things we're really excited about is the opportunity to pilot a financial assistance program for family, friend, and neighbor caregivers through this investment. Um, so we are still very early in the planning process here, um, but looking forward to being able to come back and share learnings that we have um, around how effectively uh, to support that sector of care. Next slide, please. And then the other investment I wanted to highlight is a child care worker wage enhancement. Um, this program is designed to support specifically licensed um, child care providers, um, but we have a really strong focus as well on family child care sites. And what we're looking at here is offering a wage boost or salary supplement over the course of our levy and really trying to understand how that impacts continuity of care and retention of child care providers if we are able to bring them up to financial stability. Um, so lots of uh, learning that we're excited to see in the coming couple of years. Next slide, please. And that's my presentation. I thought there was one more slide, sorry. So we... <laughs> Um, we are really excited to be able to share all of this. Again, we are, I think, sort of knee deep in our learning at this time and happy to share um, more if you have any questions um, and also very, very eager to hear from all of you. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it back over to Arabella. Great, um, thank you so we'll much. Make it out. Oh, sorry. Oh, go, go ahead, ahead Emily. Emily. I apologize. I, I was just gonna voice over a couple of questions in the chat for you, Jessica or Lucy. Um, so uh, maybe you want to speak to this, but i um, interested to know how the county came to focus on student veterans 
who need childcare? Like that's just a really interesting population. Um, is there any background you can share on the focus on that, that subpopulation? Yeah, yeah. So I'm happy to share a little bit about that. That one specifically was funded through our veterans, seniors, and human services levy. So it's a levy that is really sort of focused on a segment of um, our population. It's a relatively small pool that was directed by council, but it had come up. We had gotten feedback from student veterans specifically through our sort of general work on veterans that access to childcare when they wanted to go to school or return to school could often be a real barrier. And sometimes the barrier that even led to them sort of exploring the option of going to school. So I, I think it sort of naturally came out of a desire to support veterans as they transitioned um, into sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, regular life, that's the wrong word. Um, and so uh, as that arose as a need, there was an opportunity to allocate some funding specifically to learn uh, a little bit more about that. I think it's awesome. And it, I think really shows kind of the, the muscle of county government able to make those connections on intersecting issues like veterans, uh, non-traditional students and childcare. So that's super cool. Um, Denise asked in the, in the chat, um, it, she said, it sounds like you're differentiating between licensed family child care and FFNs who are typically unlicensed. And, you know, because every state in America defines who's licensed and who's unlicensed differently, maybe just for the good of the group, can you share a little bit about really how you define those two categories and who typically, uh, you know, you associate with licensed family child care and unregulated FFN? Yeah. I'm happy to share a little bit. And then Lucy, if you have anything to add, I'd love for you to um, jump in. So I think we sit in sort of an interesting spot as I would imagine many of you do in that we are not the regulatory agency for childcare. Um, and so we're sort of trying to augment and fill in supports and bring in um, the lens of, you know, sort of regional need um, without always having regulatory authority. Um, in our state, uh, some FFNs are sort of certified by the state. I wouldn't say quite, it's quite licensed, but they're sort of certified and they can receive subsidy and others are not. We've really taken the approach that we want to support providers and caregivers and kids where they are. And so um, we're, I think, cautious not to sort of go against what the state has determined is or is not legal. But we're also really clear that we want to provide supports to informal caregivers, whether they choose to be subsidized by the state or not. Um, and so in our state, it is a little bit gray where the line is. Typically, it's around six kiddos and or multiple families is where we see our state begin to view it as it should be licensed. Um, and so while we're certainly not trying to incentivize anyone to go against licensing you know, rules or, or that sort of legal system, we do think it's really important kids are in care to make sure that we're supporting the caregivers who are um, providing that care for them and for their families. And so we've sort of taken, I think, a more holistic view. We differentiate in terms of um, the supports that we hear are needed for different sort of populations of providers and caregivers. But I really do think we are trying to move towards a vision that looks at childcare as um, an ecosystem where there are different options of care, where there are different types of caregivers and where all of these components and people are valued for the unique thing that they bring to the table. Lucy, would you add anything to that? Oh, I think you covered it beautifully. Um, I think just one example I can provide in terms of what you were just saying around different types of supports, depending on the type of caregiver, um, is one example with Child Care Health Consultation, we did that partnership with Environmental Health to distribute non-toxic nap mats. And um, you may have noticed on the slide, maybe not, uh, that we only distributed those to licensed family child cares and not um, FFN caregivers, family friend neighbor caregivers. Um, and that was because we got feedback from the community-based organizations that are serving FFN that they didn't really have a need for them because a lot of the folks that they were serving were really grandparents taking care of their grandchildren. Um, and when the kids needed to take naps, they would take naps in the, um, in the beds so rather than like a mat on the ground and that was uh, more appropriate for them. So that's just a kind of one example of where things can be different depending on the different providers. That's super helpful. 
Um, we would really like to hear from all of you, both your questions and your share outs of, um, you know, how your communities are supporting home-based providers. But I, I'm i going to take a little, um, you know, uh, I'm going to ask a question that I have that emerged as uh, Jessica was speaking. And, you know, maybe Lucy, you want to speak to this, but you know, we really have seen across the country that one of the kind of key uh, keys to being able to recruit and really well serve family, friend, and neighbor providers is those community-based organizations. And, um, you know, particularly those that kind of share the community, the language, you know, and also organizations that really value the role of, of family, friend, and neighbor providers. So I wonder if you all would be just willing to share a little bit more about you know, who those organizations are, how you came to identify them, and the type of relationship that they have with the county. Um, I, I think that would be really helpful. Lucy, do you want to start or do you want me to go? Um, do you want to start and then I can add on? Sure, yeah. So I, I think um, I can share a little bit, if I'm stepping back, uh, to sort of the beginning of our child care health consultation work as an example, um, we really felt strongly that we knew what we knew and we didn't know what we didn't know. And so we had sort of deep relationships with some of the, I would say, larger child care players. Um, we understood sort of what a traditional child care health consultation approach looked like. Um, and we had also heard very clearly that it was not meeting everyone's needs. Um, and as we saw sort of a growing awareness of the value of informal care in particular, we recognized that there are places where the county might not be the right actor to provide that support, right? That we, we provide some support to informal caregivers directly, but we had these sort of relationships existing in community where the, the trust was much stronger. Um, and so we actually, all of our work uh, through Bus Starts for the most part is delivered by community-based organizations that we partner with and support. And so when we put out the RFP, we made a really um, clear decision to offer funding both for folks who wanted to provide this sort of more mainstream model, this, this more mainstream approach, and for folks to say, um, you know the providers and caregivers in your community. Uh, what would work as a model to serve them and to meet their needs around health and safety and quality in the care setting that they work in? Um, and so we identified at least our initial partners in that way. Um, we did a lot of outreach. Um, and what we found were a couple of key partners who were really um, uh, both a, like a culture match for the caregivers that they were serving and already doing work with caregivers or with providers. Um, and so I think an openness as a county to also be aware of the fact that we didn't know certain things. Um, and so, for example, things like one of our um, partners um, made oral uh, uh, information. So essentially a, one of the little codes that you can scan. And rather than having it go to something that you would um, that you would read in writing, it would um, provide it verbally read um, in a number of different uh, translated languages. Um, and that was a way better fit. And it's something that the county never would have been equipped to do. Um, we didn't have that understanding. We didn't have that knowledge. We didn't have those relationships. And as a result, um, that, that particular organization was able to recruit caregivers for the program much, much more easily than I think we ever could have because they were really um, grounded in the experience of those caregivers and responding to the needs of those caregivers. And so I think you know, at least from my perspective, an openness to build those relationships, but also an openness to recognize that there are places the county does really good work um, through our public health programming, and there are places where we are not the right ones to deliver those services, and the best thing we can do is reallocate resources and really support those who are doing great work already. Um, I'll just add a little bit that um, you know, for child care health consultation specifically, we have a smaller pool of um, community-based organizations, around seven that we worked with. But um, for prenatal to five, we had about 80 different community-based organizations. And then for larger BSK, I'm not sure, probably over 100 um, total. Do you know what that is, Jessica? I think we have relationships through, across the whole levy. So that's mm -hmm. on age zero to 24. I think we have relationships with over 400 uh, different community-based organizations currently. Yeah, and um, so we have a pretty broad network that we were able to build with Best Starts for Kids. And then as part of COVID response, we were able to tap into some of those networks. So 
um, partners that I hadn't been funding for our child care health consultation, we were still able to um, put together small letter agreements and work with these other organizations that um, served family, friend, and neighbor caregivers in other ways to then distribute supplies and resources and share information. So um, we were really leaning on and um, trying to provide support to these networks. Thanks. I really, I think this is such an important part of getting the strategy right, is having the right partner. So I really appreciate you sharing that detail. Um, I would like to open the conversation and include others and, um, you know, again, hear from you uh, around what you're doing in your community or um, if you have, you know, questions for Jessica and Lucy, uh, we'd love to hear them. Hi, um, I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I think one of the things, and I'm not the county. Um, we serve the whole county and we have a strong relationship with the county, but um, we're the um, r and agency for Philadelphia County. But one of the things that I'm struggling with is there are so many different initiatives and I don't want to step on them. I don't want to... Um, I don't want to pretend to reorganize them, right? But how do we how do we coordinate some kind of comprehensive plan um, with lots of different issue, different initiatives going on? I don't know if they, I have had the answer to that, but I have some thoughts on it because that's one of the things I am that kind of keeps me up at night. Um, and we've seen, I think, something similar happen with our work around homelessness in King County where um, what we saw was essentially lots of different efforts that were, that were good, right? But where there was like never enough funding or resourcing or time to do something comprehensive. And so we saw lots of small efforts that grew and grew and grew. And then we had sort of a, a, a coalition of disconnected efforts and then really had to do intentional work to say, how do we actually sort of undo this and build a regional effort of all of this in a coordinated way? And I think we feel pretty strongly that we don't want to do that around childcare. And so um, I would say there are places that I think we're doing really well and places that we're still figuring it out. At the county, similarly, you know, you'll see we had a few of these sort of different uh, initiatives and they were happening across different departments and they've grown and interest has grown. And so we're actually working now to come together as a whole group at the county, even internally once a month so that we're on um, the same page about what's happening, about how we can sort of coordinate efforts. And we're seeing, I think, more integration. So Lucy gave the example of the NAP mats and the HEPA filter. It actually took a lot to get to a place where we could integrate environmental health and childcare efforts, right? You know, and so just even those sort of micro things. From an external perspective, one of the things we're working really hard on right now, especially as we launch a subsidy program, which is weighty. Um, we have a budget of about $200 million for all of our childcare work over the next six years. And so it has the potential we recognize to make a really significant shift in the field. Um, and that's, a that's both an incredible privilege and a tough spot to be when we know our levy ends in six years and there's not a guarantee of renewal. So we're being really thoughtful about how do we do that? How do we partner with our state agencies that have this foundational statewide subsidy program so that we're not jeopardizing families who access that care? How do we partner with municipalities who've made investments so that we're, um, sort of honoring and allowing them to leverage their dollars, but also not creating exactly what you described, sort of a fractured system. Um, and I think all of it <laughs> requires just sort of continuous conversation and calibration and a willingness um, to not be proprietary. So we feel really strongly that we don't need to be proprietary over the solution. We're really lucky that we have a bunch of dollars to bring to it and some really passionate, you know, competent people who want to work on this. Um, but at the end of the day, we, we want to see, you know, access increase for families. We want to see equity in access. We want to see equity in terms of the discipline that kids experience and the families experience. We want to see equity in terms of providers thriving. So um, for us, it looks like a really strong commitment to continuing conversations and to being willing to adjust um, and to be really firm about a vision of wanting to sort of be cohesive. Um, and, you know, I'll report back in a couple of years <laughs> and see how it's going. I would love to hear from all of you. How are you doing this? 
Um, I'll just add a really quick tidbit here, Diane. Um, on this resource page that I just dropped in the chat, we have a couple of like um, checklists and action plan documents that you might use to help organize some of those conversations. Um, and just underscore what Jessica said that in a situation where we have such great need, the idea that folks are duplicating is really not okay. So, you know, to the extent that some of these tools or frameworks are helpful to kind of, you know, just, um, you know, make sure that everybody's having the greatest impact and um, is well coordinated. I, I hope they can be helpful. Um, and I hope that was helpful to you. Uh, there's some nice recommendations in the chat as well. Um, Jessica and Lucy, uh, Laura asked in the chat, like, you know, Washington County is, I mean, excuse me, King County is really um, lucky uh, as it compares to other counties because you all have a levy and, um, you know, lots of important people live in King County and work in King County, but what are the implications for others? And you know, I know that there has been some stuff happening in Pierce County that's, I don't know, exactly similar, but I wonder if you could, you know, um, speak to this question, which is like, how might other counties in Washington be learning from or adapting strategies that King County is using? Or, you know, how are you guys partnering with other counties to um, think about some of these uh, programs and ideas? That's a really good question. Um, I think you're right. I think the opportunity to have this scale of funding and political will is a really unique um, opportunity and moment in time um, because it's both, I think, the dollars and the political will of our elected leaders to really drive this work forward in a way that is um, pretty innovative. And I hold that alongside an understanding of sort of the vision that the task force I referenced earlier in my presentation set forward of what a long-term vision is. And even with that, that resourcing, we are moving towards that and it feels like an incremental move, right? A big incremental move, but there is so much further to go before we see a truly holistic and equitable system of care. And we are really aware of the fact that that can't only be us, that that has to be national, it has to be at a regional level, it has to be all of these levels working together. And so I think we're really thinking about this as a big move upstream um, that hopefully gives us more political will, more understanding of why this matters and of what the next steps are. But, you know, for example, our task force um, put out a recommendation about reinstating a subsidy program with the caveat that subsidy programs are inherently inequitable, that what we really need is a universal system of care. And so we are holding the both hand, right, that like increasing access for families and providing good wages for child care providers is a move towards better but that it is not the end goal. And so I think what I would say we can take away from this for other counties is, is the learnings that come up around wages for providers, around access for families, around barriers that don't need to be there for families and where we can move some of those. Those are things that I think you can, you can apply at the scale that you have, right? I am hopeful that the learnings that we bring will help increase political will at a national level, um, as well as then sort of within other counties. Um, but I think the other thing that we sort of hold is this idea of how do we create a roadmap to where we want to go and know that if we can't get there in this six years, where can we get to and how do we hold that as the end goal, right? And how do we hold the partnerships and relationships that need to continue to happen, whether, you know, a levy continues to be renewed in perpetuity or not, to sort of move us towards that vision. Um, so I, I hope that's mm -hmm. helpful. Yeah, and, and I might just add from the little that I know, I think given that many of your community partners are working in multiple jurisdictions, that the work they do with King County can really inspire their work elsewhere. Um, so, you know, it's, um, I, I think that's really important and that the fact that you're building the capacity of those organizations, um, you know, does have a spillover effect in other places. So um, that's great. So, um, we would love to hear from others on the call, both, uh, you know, how you might be trying to figure some of this out without, you know, a levy. I really love this question that Arabella put in the chat or other questions that you're, um, you know, um, chewing on, chewing on that you'd like to bring to the group.
Um, I'll also just make a pitch while people are thinking um, for exploring ARPA funding and, you know, Jessica mentioned both ARPA and CARES funding. Um, I think there's a lot. We've seen counties really of all sizes making investments in childcare. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of times the kind of hesitation that comes up is these funds aren't sustainable. They have an end date. But I think a lot of what Jessica was saying about the levy kind of applies to the ARPA funds, too. You know, it's still a chance to pilot things and, you know, have an example of something that really works in your community that you can use to get um, buy-in from your elected officials and kind of build that uh, public will. Um, so I just, I really liked the way that you kind of framed that, Jessica, of even when there is this window where we know the money isn't guaranteed, there's still a lot that we can accomplish. Um, maybe we can look at a couple of the reflection questions here. And I think um, the, uh, you know, a lot, um, Jessica and Lucy, as you were talking, you were really reflecting on what you're hearing and coming to know from providers and families that you're serving. And there's a question around um, data on preference and things like that. And I wonder if you all would be willing to share with us and maybe others in the group too, how you are collecting data, how you're kind of coming to know uh, what parents and caregivers need and what sort of, um, you know, data you use to drive some of these key decisions. Lucy, would you want to share a little bit about how you all are collecting data? Um, and maybe it's more about what providers and caregivers need, and then I can um, share a little bit about what we're thinking for the broader subsidy program. Sure. So with Best Starts for Kids, we were actually able to fund a deep dive evaluation of the um, program, the Child Care Health Consultation programs that we're funding. So we have a, a partner called Cardia, um, and they have basically built up from the start of these programs a database for them to be tracking the services, um, kind of and kind of what needs are. And then we have um, monthly reporting from grantees, quarterly reporting, um, and then these with COVID, these kind of monthly calls. So a lot of different opportunities for um, our community partners to be providing feedback on what they're hearing on the ground of providers' needs, families' needs, and then spaces for them to discuss with one another. So I wouldn't say all of them are necessarily formal data collection. Um, but just a lot of different ways of, you know, qualitative and um, quantitative data input. And then I would say at sort of a broader county level, there are two um, things I would highlight. The first is that we've got, um, we had that task force that I referenced that sort of morphed into an ongoing work group. Um, we invited all members of the task force in that work group and a sort of a select number did. And then we added um, additional sort of regional partners, some families, and quite a few child care providers. Um, and so uh, we sort of continually check in with them to inform um, our work. We just wrapped up our seventh meeting to sort of inform our RFP process for Best Starts work. Um, and are currently sort of thinking about how that group sort of lives on, um, recognizing that that input is really important um, and, and incredibly uh, helpful in making sure that we're investing in the right ways. Um, Best Starts also does a regular survey of families across King County um, that includes sort of questions primarily around health, um, but that sort of, it, it goes across most of the outcomes we're looking at around Best Starts. Um, and in that survey, we, we typically ask questions about what kind of care families are accessing, where it is, if they've had difficulty accessing care, um, why, um, what they've experienced in terms of exclusionary discipline. That's one we really wanna hear about. Um, I will say there are some real limitations around parents self-reporting some of those things for a lot of really good reasons. Um, but we do get some good data there. Um, and I think where we've gotten really good data in particular is in the last couple of years, understanding how the pandemic has shifted families' access to care and their preferences in what type of care they want to access. Um, so I think we do sort of a mix of, you know, regular semi-regular surveying of families that is super widespread across the county and weighted by demographics, um, as well as sort of smaller, more relationship-based ongoing conversation and listening and feedback. 
Um, and that happens both through our work groups and sort of informally through partnerships with our child care union, um, partnership with community partners. Um, and so I, I'd say it looks like a lot of different things from sort of our broader child care sc scope of work. Super helpful. Um, Denise, would you like to come off mute and share a little bit about some of the data um, that you all are collecting and, and, and how it's informing some of these key decisions? Sure. We, um, through our child care resource, can you all hear me okay? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, through our child care resource and referral system, um, child care search and other names that it has across the state, um, we track the information on parents that call in for child care referrals. Um, and my entire screen just shifted. Um, and that <laughs> includes um, the type of care hours. I think a lot of you all that do child care resource and referral are probably tracking the same thing. Type of care hours, quality of care. And we have a couple regions in our state. North Carolina is divided into 14 regions. Um, but we have a, at least one region that also tracks nanny care. Um, and then we have a couple that do track the current type of care as well. So if they're currently in family, friend, and neighbor care of some sort. Um, and we track that. Does that answer your question or did you want more? Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Um, I'd love to, like, uh, I'd be interested to know if you feel like you can share, like, how that data gets used in terms of some of this, like, regional planning or decision making. So, I'm going to say I feel like it could be used more than it is. Um, I think we all know that we collect a lot of data that we don't necessarily <laughs> look at as much, um, but, but it does help us know um, we've had, I, I think this is kind of common across the country, um, and I know I'm not the only one from another state on the call, but um, that we've seen a real decrease in family child care. I came here from Oklahoma in 2007, um, and we've probably decreased our number of family child care programs in about half since that time. Um, but it does help us know what parents are looking for and what they're needing. Um, and it certainly, family child care certainly meets needs much more for some of our lower income families, those that are working second and third shift or weekends. Um, and one of the things that we've done is been able to really start a family child care home project. I don't do that personally, but I work on our, with our state group um, and so that's something that we've really started focusing on a lot more is providing those supports even though regionally a lot of us do work with family child care um, they've started that during covid more on a statewide perspective awesome that's great thank you so much for sharing and thank you so much to jessica and to lucy and for all of you joining us i'm going to turn it back over to arabella Thank you, everyone. This was such an interesting discussion and presentation. Um, just want to thank you all for your time and for coming on and a meeting coming on video and sharing what you're seeing. That's really the goal of these discussions um, is just to create this space for you all to come together and learn from each other. Um, thank you also to our speakers. Thank you to Natalie, who joined all three of our Peer Learning Network convenings this uh, past week. Um, and thank you to Jessica and Lucy for your presentation today and for all the great work you're doing in King County. Um, I also want to thank the National Collaborative for Infants and Toddlers, a project of the Pritzker Children's Initiative, for their gracious support and partnership in our work. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, we encourage you to continue the conversation on the Counties for Kids neighborhood. Um, after this event, you'll receive an email with a recording of today's session, the slide deck, uh, the resources from our speakers and a guide for the neighborhood. Um, you'll also get a survey about today's convening um, and would really just encourage you to take a few minutes to fill that out. Um, your feedback is really important to us and it helps inform our future programming. Um, so that link is in the chat now as well and it'll be in that follow up email. Um, and again, thank you all for coming and stay tuned for our next series. Have a good rest of your day.